Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Today we're looking at the Smith & Wesson M&P 10. Now this has been out for quite some time. It's a very interesting offering by Smith & Wesson. Uh, just to go back in time a little bit, uh, Smith & Wesson has pretty much been, uh, since the adoption of their M&P, you can't, you can't beat them and join them. Uh, if you look at Smith & Wesson's early involvement with the, uh, the Smith & Wesson Sigma series where they're trying to uh, compete with Glock, uh, didn't work out very well. Basically, they they had clock they had copied the Glock pistol uh, and ended up going to court over it. And they introduced the M and P series. Uh, the M and P series striker fire pistol, similar to a Glock. Uh, that was what they were hoping was going to pull them out of their funk they had with the, with the loss in uh, a lot of the sales they've had for revolvers because law enforcement switched over to nine millimeter, as well as the uh, the fact that their pistols that they were had really weren't up to par with what was going on. They had competed in some of the military contracts, uh, for instance, the XM9 program, Smith & Wesson didn't even make it through the down select. They had not had a lot of luck with them. And then if you look at the M&P, the M&P was competing in the XM17 trials and did not fare very well. When it came to rifles, I think it was another one of those things where Smith & Wesson said that, uh, you know, that's the most popular rifle in the industry was the AR-15, so I guess we better do our own. Uh, hence the M&P rifle came out. When the M&P rifle came out, it was not what you would say a higher tier uh, AR-15 type rifle. I can recall uh, working uh, in, in New York, Rochester, New York, as a, in, in forensics. Again, I maintained a lot of the weapons for the local police departments that were around. And one of our departments uh, had adopted the Smith & Wesson M&P 45, and Smith & Wesson basically just gave them some of the M&P uh, rifles. Well, unfortunately, I had both the rifles at my uh, my house the next day uh, when they went out and tried to qualify with them because you had a lot of failures to extract and eject. So they certainly did have some issues, uh, you know, going back. Uh, they've done a lot to correct those issues. I still view Smith and Weston as more of a lower tier, uh, you know, lower mid. I guess uh, it wouldn't be the lowest, but uh, I would I would I'd probably put them around where Aero Precision are some of the more affordable uh, variations. The popularity of the AR-10, it certainly made sense for them to go ahead and, and make a rifle very, very similar. So I have to say, when they did it, uh, they did not just copy somebody else's and go generic. Uh, they did a lot of work on their own. You know, the barrel you have here is a 4140 barrel with their Armor Knight finish. Uh, you do see we have, they do even have their own customized type of flash suppressor, uh, which is a, basically a bird cage. It has some indentations on here as well, uh, which can be used for any number of things. Now when you look at the uh, get the gas block on here. You do see a Milstander 1913 rail on here, uh, two slots. Um, one of the my disappointments is, is that these are held on by set screws. I would have much rather have seen these or held on by clamping screws. I would much would rather have seen this uh, done for as far as a drilled and pinned, uh, just because of the durability. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over some of the specifications on this. We're looking at a 308 Winchester caliber 760 by 51 millimeter rifle. The magazine that utilizes is the SR25 type magazine. It does come with a Magpul PMAG. Um, when I tested this rifle, I tested it with several, um, including C Products Defense. I tested it with the uh, Lancer Technology uh, 7.62 magazine. I tested it with a uh, nice armament SR25 type magazine, and we definitely had no issues with magazines whatsoever as far as feeding was concerned. The receivers, you're looking at um, 7075 T6 aircraft grade aluminum upper and lower receivers. They did an excellent job on these receivers, which we're, which we're going to get to. We're looking overall 8 pounds. So starting at the stock, we're looking at standard mill spec type stock. We're looking at uh, 6 position. Now one of the things that they did really, really nice on this is you can see how this, uh, this receiver extension is showing. They utilized the proper 308 or 762 receiver extension, which utilizes a longer extension so you can use M4 buffers instead of having to use the shorter ones that are used on the commercial ones. Now, the reason why you see a lot of the guys using the shorter buffers, the standard M4 buffers on here, is just for parts commonality. They don't want to stock additional parts. However, if you want to make this rifle reliable, you need to give it the longer extension so it can use the proper weights. Uh, the only negative aspect of this is the buffer that they, threw, they put in here was a standard carbine buffer, three steel. I would like them to see them go with an H2 buffer in here instead of the standard uh, carbine weight buffer that they did. Now looking at the upper receiver, you'll see we have a fire cartridge case deflector and they did go with a forward assist, ejection port dust cover. Now looking at the lower receiver, you'll see we have an ambi safety. Uh, which uh, this both, both the throw lever arms on these are both the same, they're a little bit shorter, so it makes sure that when you're on fire, that your finger's not going to get anywhere near the safety. We do have a ambidextrous bolt catch and bolt release. Now, on most of these rifles, uh, in, in fact, uh, like, for instance, like the Colt LE901, you basically only have a release on the right-hand side versus uh, a stop and release. And if you wanted to release the bolt, you have to go to the left-hand side. These guys here are very similar to that, like Lewis Machine and Tool and LWRC, where you can engage the bolt catch from the right-hand side, pull the bolt back, lift up, 
there you have it. Now it's a little bit stiff to release on the right hand side. So I'm not sure uh, why that is. This should be a lot easier, but it does require a lot more force than normal. You have your magazine release, and you also have your your fence around the magazine release uh, to ensure it's not going to go off accidentally or drop accidentally. Standard A2 grip. The trigger you have on here is a standard mil spec trigger. You're probably looking at around six and a half to seven pounds. Uh, it's not a great trigger, but it's not a bad trigger for what this is designed for. It's more of a hunting or a law enforcement containment rifle. Um, it does just fine. Uh, you're not going to be putting bullets through the exact same hole at 100 yards uh, with the way this thing is set up here. Now looking at the left-hand side, we see, again, we see our safety here, which has the, the shorter uh, arm on it. We have our ambidextrous magazine release, and we have our standard, standard ping pong paddle uh, bolt catch, which you can engage from the, from the uh, bottom and push to release from the top. Overall fit and finish of it's very, very nice. A good charcoal gray type finish. Now looking at the barrel, as we said, 4140 stainless steel. Uh, it's a 1 in 10 inch twist. They utilize the 5R rifling on here and their Arbor Knight type finish. Uh, it's a little bit more of a, a mid-length gas system. I'm not going to say it's completely, but it's not necessarily a standard carbine as, uh, as well. Handguards, these are just standard rudimentary type handguards that, that heat up really, really, really quick. Now we're going to take this thing apart and see what makes it tick. So as we see, this is a standard mill spec type trigger. Now if you want to get your hands on a geyser or put whatever you want here, this is all industry standard for as far as the trigger mechanism is concerned. Again, taking a look at the uh, buffer. As you can see here, we have a standard carbine three-way buffer. This again probably should have been an H or an H2 uh, due to the way this thing was gassed. Uh, the ammunition made a big difference in the way that it was fired too. If you fired 7.62 NATO, uh, it wasn't nearly as, uh, as stout as it was if you fired some good 308 caliber ammunition. Uh, we did see a couple failures with some of the 308 uh, ammunition, which was rather rather strange. Uh, they were more short stroking. But one of the things that can happen with these guns, um, the viewer who loaned this to me, uh, to my understanding, this was a brand new rifle. One of the things that can happen with five, with any of these uh, type rifles where you have a gas block that slides over the barrel, before you uh, before it's fired, you have a very narrow gap uh, that can be between the the barrel and the uh, gas block. Now, gas can escape through there until it forms what we refer to as a carbon seal. What the carbon seal does is all the gas that blows up will seal off that gas port, and then that will make it so there's no gas leakage. Uh, which is what I think happened with this one, because the first few rounds that we fired, we did have some short stroking, and then after that it was fine. So my guess was, was there was a little bit of a gap here that you need to form the uh, the seal uh, uh, between, the, between the gas block and the uh, barrel. We can see how the bolt catch works. Can be dexterous. Now taking a look at the bolt carrier. Now, the bolt carrier on here was very, very well made. Uh, you can see that we have manganese phosphate, the standard uh, 7.62 type carrier. This is their own carrier. This is not something that they get from somebody else, their own design. So we're pop through, remove the firing pin retaining pin. And we do have a firing pin spring on here. The reason why you see firing pin springs on a lot of 5.56 and even the 7.62s is because when you're using uh, NATO ammunition, you're using a military grade primer, which is a hard primer, and this prevents uh, you from ha and you know, that prevents you from having slam fires for just from the bolt actuating. Now, when you use commercial ammunition, commercial ammunition uses a much lighter primer, and then you do have the risk of a sensitive primer just when the bolt closes having a slam fire. So having that uh, spring on there prevents that from happening. We have a standard cam pin. And there's your carrier. Now this is a manganese phosphate uh, carrier that is chrome plated, which is also a nice touch. You see too many companies these days are just going nitride on everything and they skip the, the chroming uh, process. Now is when I want to get into something that's really neat about this rifle. And that is the extractor. Taking a look at the extractor, you'll see we have a good crud groove in here too. One of the things that happens with, uh, especially when you have a very strong extractor, and you can see this has a, a standard extractor buffer and the rubber O-ring, sometimes when, that, when the extractor steps over the, uh, the extractor groove on the brass, it has chips. And those chips will accum accumulate on the inside of the extractor. Well, this gives them a place to go so it won't affect uh, the way the extractor works. So that's a neat little enhancement I thought that they had on there. Now looking at the bolt, basically it's a 7.62 standard uh, type bolt, nothing really special about it. Um, 
Very, very well made though. It was very, very durable. Uh, industry standard gas rings. Reassembly very simple. Drop in your extractor. Extractor pin. Always make sure your extractor is on the right hand side. Drop in your cam pin. Give it its one quarter turn. Now when you drop your firing pin in, you need to make sure you push it inward before you put in your firing pin rotating pin. Because if you don't, that'll pop out. So you wanna make sure that that's retained. Now we're gonna take a look at the upper receiver. There's a couple interesting things you wanna take a look at in the receiver. We have these little shims that you'll see on the front and in the rear. Uh, one, of the, one of the ones in the rear is missing. What this enables you to do is when you close the receivers, it gets rid of any of your wobbling. So these, when these two upper and lower receivers fit together, they are tight as can be. Take a look at the profile of the barrel. As you can see, we have a medium contour barrel. This is not, I would say, heavy. Uh, I would say it's a medium contour barrel. It just makes it uh, you know, easier to carry around. Because again, this could be certainly used as a hunting rifle or as a police containment rifle where you don't necessarily want a barrel that's gonna be extremely heavy. And you can see we have no heat shields in the handguards. And if you notice, we do have M4 feed ramps on here as well for aid in, in feeding. Now the MSRP is uh, about $16.39. Now this is as, as advertised as optics ready. It does not come with any kind of an optics. You can see I have a US optics uh, scope on here that we use for testing. Now this is the 18 inch version. There is another version which is called the, the MMP Sport, which is 1,069. Basically it's the exact same rifle you see here, but a 16 inch barrel instead of an 18 inch barrel. Uh, both of them are, are available now. As of now, uh, with the current political climate, I'm not sure what the availability is, is for any of these. But I think what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go to the range and we're gonna see how this one shoots.
as I said, the only problems that we had with that, with reliability was just the uh, the first magazine. Uh, and again, I believe that was a carbon seal issue. Once that got taken care of, we were good to go. Now, the ammunition that we tested uh, was several. We had the Black Hills 169 and 175 grain OTM. We had SIG 169 grain OTM, 175 grain OTM, as well as some PPU uh, full metal jacket. The best group, believe it or not, was 1.03 inches with the Black Hills 175 grain OTM. Now, that was the best group. This thing averaged around two to two and a half inch. Uh, it was sort of a fluke, uh, but I was able to get that. Uh, but that was that was the best uh, group that we got. Now, one thing you notice with a barrel that's this thin is as this barrel heats up, your groups get wider and wider. Uh, again, this is designed as a hunting type rifle or a containment type rifle, not as anything that's being uh, rapid fire uh, and have any kind of precision type accuracy. So, like most thin barrel guns on uh, like this, you do as the barrels get hot, you do get some more dispersion with it. So overall, I think this is a very, very well-made rifle if you want a 308 for the $1,600 price range. Uh, I think this is an excellent rifle. It gives you a lot of features for, for that kind of money. Uh, the fully ambidextrous lower receiver is nice. You do have the integral trigger guard. You know, and also for as far as uh, accessories, uh, this will take any pistol grip, any stock uh, that, you, that you could possibly want to put on it. For as far as the uh, muzzle device, it's a standard. You could put a suppressor on here if you so chose. Um, again, the only thing I really would like to see differently on here is the, uh, instead of the clamped on front sight base, the drilled in pin, because these things do tend to migrate forward. Uh, that's the only thing, but we didn't fire enough rounds. Unfortunately, uh, with the lack of availability of ammunition at this point, uh, we're, we're having to really restrict how much shooting that we do. But uh, we have a viewer we'd like to thank for this. Uh, he knows who he is for letting us borrow this and to thank him for his patience. And we'll try to get this back to you soon. I uh, hope you all did enjoy this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, even better share. Please consider becoming part of our Patreon family. We're a, fu a viewer-funded channel. Thank you.